uh, we've got enough time to go through all the impressive material. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, it's 12 o'clock sharp, so let's get going. Um, so we've got two sections. These are the best sections, I hope. We've got seven lectures to go through them. Spend a couple of lectures on this one, and then uh, we'll go into uh, uh, unusual sources of radiation. So hopefully you'll find this to be the best bit of the course, right? So we're going to talk today about guided radiation, which is extremely important both scientifically and technically. Okay. Now, remember what we said all the way back in section two. Okay. So we said an antenna is a source of electromagnetic radiation. Okay. And of course, we often use this radiation in a variety of contexts. And to begin with, we have this kind of quaint idea that we have a source, A, okay, emitting radiation. We know that when received by some receiver, B, at some distance away, let's say where well, that distance is D, okay, we know that the receiver will pick up whatever electric field is there, that's the reversibility of our antenna concept, and we know that the intensity, the energy transfer drops as 1 over R squared, or 1 over D squared, according to this, this dimension here, the separation between A and B. So this is our power transfer, isn't it, between A and B. So if we think of A as providing some signal strength and B receiving it, clearly 1 over D squared is not great, it's inefficient. Okay. So that's our concept to begin with. 1 over R squared is not as good as it can be. Now, of course, in free space, like, for example, our Winter Hill transmitter that's up over there, about 30 miles from here, you don't really get much choice about how you do things, right? So in free space, we don't have much choice. But we can do better than that. Can we think of objects which we can use to transfer the power with less loss? Okay, so we can redraw our picture, A and B. Okay. And we imagine that rather than radiation being spreading out, spread out um, in all directions, we'd like to confine it somehow. And yes, the answer is, we can put some kind of boundary, for example, around it. Okay. And this boundary guides the radiation. It guides the waves, so we can call it a waveguide. And our basic concept here is somehow the radiation is being reflected somehow from the walls without absorption. Now we imagine there will be some absorption in reality, so there will be transmission with some loss. Perhaps this loss might be 1 over d, it might be e to the minus d with some kind of constant, some distance you might travel, okay? Keep drawing these little tills who really do proportional, shouldn't they? Yeah? Okay. So we do have these kind of objects, and there are two main kinds. So this is the second one, the waveguide, as we'll spend most of our time talking about. Okay? But uh, the two main kinds are called transmission lines, which in a sense are forms of guided wave, a way of guiding waves, and we'll see the connection shortly. And we have proper waveguides. Okay. Right. So we should probably define what these objects are. Okay. So we def our definitions to be more specific about what these things are. Okay. Transmission lines are composed of at least two parallel conductors. And what we mean by having two parallel conductors, of course, by implication, they must be separated by an insulator of some kind, either air or vacuum or something else, something across which we can maintain a voltage, right? That's what we mean by, by, uh, by, having, by having two things. A waveguide is different. In a waveguide, it's only got one conductor, okay? So it's one conducting thing, right? Such as a, a hollow tube, for example, okay? And this can be a conductor normally, that's what we normally think is a waveguide, but it could, in fact, be also be a, or a dielectric, where we think of the boundary of that dielectric as providing some wall against which the radiation can reflect. So we talked about, didn't we, the, uh, the, the um, uh, reflection when we're above that critical angle, right? So we can imagine an optical fibre as a waveguide where the reflecting surface is that boundary between the two refractive indices. 
But normally what we'll say here is we'll think about a conducting boundary, but it has the same effect on the wave. Okay? So what kind of transmission lines might we come across? We'll go back up here. I'm kind of messing with your notes, sorry. <laughs> uh, power lines are a form of transmission line. Okay? Uh, coaxial cables, you'll have used those. Yeah, coaxial cables. And the so-called strip line, we'll look at that example in a bit more detail. Strip lines. Okay. Sometimes said as two words, sometimes as one. And in particular, we'll look at a thing called the micro strip. Because the original strip line isn't used very much now. Uh, the micro strip is what we normally use. Uh, they, geometrically, they're, they're analogous but different. Okay. And in waveguides, we said, well, we have. We're going to deal with rectangular waveguides because the boundary conditions are easier. Okay, rectangular waveguides. Uh, messing with my own notes here. And optical fibres, as we said just now. Okay. Well, we'll only talk in general terms about optical fibres. It's the uh, it's the transmission lines and waveguide stuff that you really need to know about. Now, who who is who was inspired to do this? Well, our old friend Oliver Lodge. Okay, Oliver Lodge. He made a spark gap, so so it was a, not a great transmitter, but by making a spark over here and then looking at the voltage generated over here some distance away he put a cylinder between the two and notice that the amplitude here right, did not fall as 1 over r squared okay that was the observation made so this was Oliver Lodge our old Liverpudlian friend who discovered this idea in 1884. This is the very birth of the idea of electromagnetic radiation in general. So that's our inspiration. So let's look at transmission lines. So what is a transmission line? Well, we have our basic idea, and we have a source or transmitter. And here we're going to think about it in terms of some kind of varying voltage and current. So we're going to derive how waves propagate. Okay? So we have some kind of long pair of conductors. And we imagine a closed circuit. So the current at the top must be opposite to the current at the bottom. And we'll say to start with that Z equals zero. This is you know, our, 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 our distance of transmission from our source over here is experienced at some distance z equals l at the other end by a load okay so the load is the thing that that experiences that signal and then closes the circuit and sends sends a signal back okay this is our receiver over here okay so we'll assume that this thing in the middle is some kind of uniform long line okay where the length is certainly much greater than some wavelength of waves on that line. Okay. So these could be parallel wires. Right. Parallel wires. A coaxial cable is a kind of par parallel wire, except one wire is inside the other. And the more astute of you will have already recognised why that's an advantage if we have an oscillating, an oscillating current. And we should compare this to ordinary circuit theory. And the basic idea here is in, in an ordinary circuit, you can't have a different voltage at different places along that wire. Right? So when, lamp, when, when, the, when the length of the wire is much less than the wavelength, then all the voltage is the same all the way along. Right? But in a transmission line, they can be different, and they can vary with time from one end to the other. So this is the idea of being able to propagate waves along that line. So let's think about how we can propagate waves along that line. So this is one way of thinking about the guidance of a wave. We'll see there's an equivalence between a waveguide and, and a transmission line. So we're going to assume to begin with that we have a lossless line. So there's no resistance. Now clearly, it's going to be very interesting to add in resistance to these equations. So you should look that up. Okay? That's a bit of background reading you should do. So I'm going to show you the lossless case. So let's imagine two conductors again. Make them a bit thicker just to show clearly that we've got some conductors. Right. Okay. Some conductors. Okay. 
And I'm not going to write down the source directly, but I'm going to say at one end I'm applying a voltage, and I'm thinking about a piece of this wire, or pieces of this, of this, of this pair of wires, okay? And I imagine some distance delta Z, okay? And I ignore what's happening on the rest of the wire, I'm just thinking what's happening across delta Z. And I'm, I'm realizing that I can have a different voltage here, so V, well, presumably there's some variation of voltage with Z, so I can write down the change of voltage as del V by del Z delta Z for some small distance of motion along the pair of wires. And similarly, whatever current is flowing along the top, I, remember this is all varying with position and time, right? So voltage is also varying with position and time. Let's say <coughs> I is varying with position and time, and on the other side, it may have also modified, we don't know quite how yet. Let's imagine it's changed by some di by dz, dz. And already, we've got something which looks like the makings of a wave equation. Why is the voltage different on the two sides of that little section of pair of wires? Well, that's because, regardless of what's between it, right, whether it's air or dielectric or something else, it's something non-conducting, there will be a capacitance, okay? So we can draw an equivalent circuit. The two pieces of wire look, from the point of view of the voltage and current, as an equivalent circuit. Okay. So we can draw that down there. And as well as having a capacitance, there's also an inductance. Okay. So we can draw a little inductor. All right. And that's our equivalent circuit. So the inductor has an inductance L delta Z. Well, what I'm writing is L is the, the inductance of a certain of, uh, per unit length of the wire, so that's why it's given L tilde. Okay? So the inductance is L delta Z, where L is the inductance per unit length. And similarly, we can write the capacitance C as C tilde delta Z. Okay? So everything's varying with time, and, if, and the currents and the voltage are varying with position. Just note down L tilde, inductance per unit length. Unit length, and C tilde, capacitance per unit length. Per unit length. Okay. So now we can work out, by using that equivalent circuit idea, we can work out what delta V across the inductance is. Okay. Delta V equals dv by dz, delta z, okay, that how, that's how big it is, that's just a redefinition, and we can relate that to the inductance, okay, that whatever the change of the current is, it's inducing a voltage, I by dt, so the rate of change of the current multiplied by the inductance gives me the change in voltage, the difference in voltage across the inductance. So that's how we get delta V. Now because there's a current flowing, if there's a current flowing, and remember it's flowing one way at the top and it's obviously flowing the other way at the bottom, right? we're also going to get charging of the capacitance. Okay, that capacitor will charge. So the charging, okay, let's write that down. We imagine that if there's current coming out of the capacitor right, over some length, that must be the amount of charge that comes out as a function of time must be to do with the, capaci the capacitance times the voltage. Okay, that's the you've seen that relationship before. It should be d by d z there. Sorry, sorry, d by d t there. Okay, right. you've seen that idea about the current and the capacitance being related. Just. There's a couple of extra delta z's there to say which we're, we're thinking about this across one unit of, uh, of, of length, one little piece of the conductor. Okay. So that is the capacitance and voltage across that capacitor, but we simply restate that capacitance in terms of uh, the capacitance per unit length. Okay. So it's just C tilde delta V and just changing the actual capacitance to the capacitance per unit length there. So now I can relate the rate of change of current over a distance to the rate of change of uh, rate of change in time of the charging, and I can do vice versa. I can work out the voltage 
being generated for a certain rate of change of current. It's somewhat symmetric, right? And we look at those equations and we eliminate delta z. And if you try doing this, you can derive two very important equations. Okay. Right. Let's get rid of all the delta z's. And it tells me that that's an equal sign. Yeah. Tells me that the the, the ch that, that, that per, per unit distance travelled, the change of current along that distance must be due to the fact that there's charging going on, because the charge is being absorbed by the capacitance. It's being absorbed at a rate delta V by delta T. And similarly, there is a voltage generated because the current is trying to change, and that's to do with the inductance. Okay? That's the physics of what we're saying. Now, this was first discovered as an idea when people first started looking at very long transmission lines, and that was originally done for telegraphy, the sending of messages over wires. And that's why they're called the telegrapher's equations. Okay. So those are the first order differential equations linking a change in distance with a change in time. Now, how do we turn that into what we want if we're thinking of waves traveling along that transmission line? That's what we're, what we're expecting to be important here. We want to differentiate so we can differentiate two ways. The first way is we can differentiate, okay, so we're going to differentiate equation one with respect to z and equation two with respect to t, okay? And that gives us d2i by z squared equals minus c tilde d2v by dz dt, okay, that's easy enough. That's equation one. Equation two, a presto, d2v, dt, dz, which is just the same as the other way around, isn't it? It's minus L tilde, d2i, dz squared. Okay? And obviously you can see that that term and that term are the same. Right? They're the same. So we can straight away get an equation which only has i in it. We've eliminated v by equating those two terms. And we get d2y by dz squared equals L tilde, C tilde. So if you've seen those two, those two uh, quantities appear before in resonance circuit theory, haven't you? Okay. Some kind of frequency going on there. And that's a wave equation. Right. Now if you differentiate the other way around, and you differentiate number one with respect to T, and differentiate number two with respect to Z, of course you'll get another equation which you can eliminate and it gives you an equivalent equation for V, and you should do that, okay? Just, just give you some familiarity, just show that you can do that. dtv by dt squared. And those are two wave equations. And notice that they have same values of L tilde and C tilde, right? So we know what wave equations are, right? We've seen them before. We know that this is the speed. Let's just show that explicitly. These are wave equations for a transmission line. Let's imagine I have some steady state solution. So again, I'm trying to drive a certain frequency. So I imagine my voltage source. Okay. There's my voltage source. Slide up a little bit. So I'm setting the voltage source to be oscillating at some frequency. And I'm trying to figure out what the voltage looks like along that wire as a function of position and time. Okay. I'm just checking when I write that down, it does satisfy this wave equation. So there's a frequency. I imagine a wave-like form. So there'll be some sinusoidal variation of V, both in time and in, distance, and in position. And I imagine there will also be some current that's doing the same thing. Okay. So we've seen this lots of times before. So we satisfy the wave equations. Check that you can do that, just substitute in. And obviously here, the velocity of the wave, which is equal to omega over k, the phase velocity, you can show very quickly that it must be equal to 1 over root L tilde C tilde. Okay. And of course, it's the same V in both cases, isn't it? All right. The current and the voltage, both, those, it, that sinusoidal shape travels at the same velocity down the transmission line. And importantly, 
if L tilde and C tilde are both real valued, then K is real. We've seen that kind of idea in section three, haven't we? And of course, that would be true if omega is real, which of course it is, isn't it? So if there's no resistance in the wire, and we derive the equations in this manner, then the wave travels okay, along the transmission line with no attenuation. Now we do remark briefly what would happen if I added resistance to this picture? What would it look like? Okay. If I add resistance to this picture, let's bring that picture again, we can add resistance either here, somewhat like some series, or we can add, res so that's resistance along the wire, or we can add resistance across. Okay. The long ways is a bit easy to look at. Okay. Try putting that in, see what it looks like. Okay, okay. now, you've seen this transmission line. V, according to this, is independent of the frequency omega. Okay. Assuming that the inductance and capacitance are also independent of omega. And in that situation, there is therefore no dispersion. Remember what we said what dispersion was. Dispersion is a pulse composed of different frequencies. And if there's no dispersion, that pulse does not disperse because the frequency, the different frequencies are all travelling at the same velocity. Okay. Now we can substitute those solutions, these ones here, B and I, we can substitute those into the wave equations. We already did that, and you should check that you can do that to see that they do satisfy the wave equations. When you do that, you can cancel out the e to the i omega t terms, show you can do that, and you can get kv0 equals omega l tilde i0, and ki0 equals omega c tilde v0. Okay, try doing that. Algebraically straightforward, isn't it? So you can relate the magnitude of the voltage to the magnitude of the current in two different ways. For some unknown in between, which does suggest that if you divide those two equations together, you get the V0 over I0, which is obviously the impedance we're, we're hoping to, uh, to obtain. Okay? That's the impedance of that transmission line. Okay? So it's characteristic of that transmission line. And soon, you can see, aha, this must have something to do with that free space impedance. Must have something to do with some of those other impedances we'll be looking at, and it will do momentarily. Okay? So here, we've seen directly, by considering it in this sort of circuit theory idea, it's equal to L tilde over C tilde. Okay? And again, so this is, this is somewhat suggestive of something we've seen before, right? So again, we say L tilde and C tilde are both real. Okay. And if they're both real, then Z is real. What does that mean? Well, we saw this before, didn't we? V and I oscillate in phase with each other. As we saw before in our consideration of conductors, and well, dielectrics actually, because it was true in dielectrics, wasn't it? All right. So that's our basic idea of a transmission line. Now, not many, transmission li not many transmission lines are composed of just two wires. There are two practical cases that we're going to look at. First one is the coaxial cable. Okay. So practical transmission lines. The first one is the coax. And this is explicitly covered in one of the example sheets, okay, example sheet four. So this is still a transmission line where I have, let's draw one of the wires first. Okay, there's our wire. 
So that's one wire and the current is going up it. And again, it has a wave-like form, it varies with Z and it varies with T. But now we're surrounded with a so-called sheaf, which is also conducting. Okay. And of course, whatever current is going up, the, up that way, it must be coming down the other way, also varying the Z and T. And now we can see the advantage of making it as a coax. It should really go around the outside there, shouldn't it? <laughs> okay. Because if we imagine looking around the outside of that whole cable, if we've got a certain amount of charge going that way and a certain charge going that way and, and currents moving, there's nothing happening on the outside. They all cancel out. So there's no electric field and no magnetic field outside a coaxial cable to first order. There might be some leakage, there might be some imbalances, but basically, outside, there's no B and there's no E. Okay? So that's really handy. So firstly, the cable does not influence anything else, and nothing else influences the cable. Right? Which is practically significant. You can lay the cables next to each other and they won't interfere with each other. You won't get a you won't get a, 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 a crosstalk between them. So what's happening inside, of course you've got at any given moment, imagine there is a certain charge at the centre and the opposite charge on the outside, there will be a, a radial electric field. And in a given instant, any particular location, there will also be a current flowing. Let's say it's flowing the way I've shown. There will be a magnetic field going that way. And because it will vary, it will reverse and change in magnitude as a function of distance along the cable. Okay? Now, if you follow the example sheet, you'll be able to show straightforwardly, by consideration of those electric and magnetic fields, Okay, there's a work answer in the example sheet that we can, by using the permittivities and permeabilities, we can show that the characteristic capacitance, the capacitance per unit length C tilde, and the characteristic inductance have these forms. Okay. The important thing here is A is the radius of the outer edge of the central conductor, and B is the radius of the sheaf. Okay. You can see by doing an integration of 1 over E, this is where the logs come from, or integration of 1 over B. But the example sheet will go through that in detail. So do do that example sheet, of course. Now, we look again at our statement about the velocity of the waves. Okay, so we'll bring that back up again. There it is. Velocity equals omega over k. 1 over root L tilde C tilde. It's just the same as it was before. Okay? The velocity of waves in any transmission line is equal to 1 over root L tilde C tilde. And in this case, it's modified, isn't it? It's slowed down a bit compared to the speed of light. Okay? So in our other transmission line, we didn't actually have a particular value for L tilde and C tilde. Here we've worked it out explicitly, and we see that it's smaller than the speed of light. Okay. And what's really interesting is, where are these values of epsilon and mu, epsilon r and mu r coming from? Well, these epsilon and mu r's, when we, when we do this calculation, we see that these are the values in the dielectric. Okay? And that's a remarkable statement. It says that even though we've wrapped the dielectric up and we've made these boundaries, okay, you can imagine that the the voltage is now being confined inside that coaxial cable, and the current is as well, of course. Right? We are giving some kind of oscillating signal which is travelling down that cable. It's travelling along it with no attenuation. It's not going as 1 over R squared anymore because it's going down the cable. And of course, according to our model, there's no attenuation. But the speed of the wave as it travels along okay, is the same as if there were no conductor. The function of the conductor is merely to reflect and guide, it does not change the velocity. The velocity is only due, due to the fact that, there's a di that it's a dielectric, it's the dielectric properties. And again, mu r is often 1, right? We, we keep saying that. Now what does the impedance look like? Well, the impedance, you should try and remember these two formally. Impedance is root L over root C, and explicitly here, 
it's different. So the velocity does not depend on the geometry of the cable. Notice that the log B over A, the size of the cable cancelled out. It doesn't matter what the size of the cable is, the velocity is the same. The impedance does vary, and if you just work it out, you press it, comes as log B over A, and then it's the mu r's and mu naughts just end up on the other side to each other. Okay? Right. So that's our coaxial cable case. Now, if you take a coaxial cable and you flatten it with a big hammer, right, it will end up looking like this. Like so. Imagine a coaxial cable, you hit it really hard and you flatten it out. To some extent, you can start ignoring the sides of the cable because there's no, if you apply a voltage between the outer part and the center part, the flatter it gets, the more perpendicular the voltages look. Okay? So you can start to ignore the sides of the cable. And this is the idea of the strip line. So the original strip line was a central piece and then two so-called ground surfaces, one above and one below. Okay? I'll put a little bit more in the notes about that, just a bit of history. Those aren't used much now, but what is used now is a thing called the strip line or the microstrip. So, the, so the, it's still a strip line, but the, but the original strip line had two of these so-called ground surfaces, the outer surfaces. Right? But on a printed circuit board, right, it's called microstrip. Okay, so I'm going to call it strip line and microstrip. So we, we picture it as follows. So we have our kind of approximate picture that if we take a coaxial cable and flatten it, the voltages sort of go perpendicular to those two flattened surfaces. Right? And somehow the coaxial cable and that strip line are kind of similar, aren't they? We've still got a different voltage in the central bit compared to the top and bottom bits. But on a printed circuit board, we have something similar but slightly different. Imagine now we've got some kind of ground plate. So if you ever look to the circuit board, you'll see that most of them have a metallic ground plate. So you open up an old mobile phone, and now there's billions of these things, right, find a dodgy one that's not working, prise it open, and you'll see on it is a teeny tiny circuit board, and there will be some so-called RF components, remember the mobile phone frequencies are gigahertz, and at gigahertz frequencies, the circuit board is big <coughs> enough that it takes time for that signal to propagate, you can have different voltages at different points along, along different parts of that circuit board. Okay. So we imagine tracks on the circuit board, okay, like so, that go off further on maybe. Okay, they have, say, some width W. And I imagine some current flowing along them. And there must be some compensating current flowing in the ground plane. And to some extent, I don't really care how wide the ground plane is. And I imagine that this length here is long, again, compared to the wavelength. So imagine a high frequency signal on this. And this is almost the same as a strip line. Imagine a small gap here, so that inside that region there, as long as the width is large compared to the gap, then all the voltages are now perpendicular, aren't they? They, start, they go from one side to the other, so now it doesn't really matter how wide the ground plane is. And as long as I, as long as I um, don't worry about, um, what am I trying to say here? As long as, um, as long as I, as, I, as I consider it carefully, I don't need to worry about the fact that no voltage is going up. This is basically equivalent in terms of transmitting waves as a strip line that has another ground plane above it. Okay? So again, what does this have to be in between? Well, it has to be some kind of insulating dielectric. Okay? And again, this length here that we call, we're saying here is much greater than lambda. Okay? Much greater than lambda and we imagine some current going back up for any current coming down. So that's our picture. Okay. So these are, these are how PCBs work, printed circuit boards at high frequency. Okay. So we're thinking about you know, some chip-to-chip -chip connection. Right. For a high enough frequency, the signal that travels from one connection A to another connection B will travel without attenuation, but it will travel with some kind of delay. Right. And we have to take that into account into it in, in any circuit design. So there must be a maximum frequency that we can we can operate a chip at because of this behaviour. Right. So the basic concept here is there must be a propagation delay 
at high frequency. Right. So because we have a, a, a width W which is large compared to G, we can assume that as the current flows, the magnetic fields in the strip line, so here's my strip line, okay, we have a certain voltage V at a given time, and a certain current I, which is constant all over the surfaces, so therefore there is a uniform magnetic field okay, from these currents I. And again, show that you can, you can obtain that. The magnetic flux, phi, over that cross-sectional area, that's a, some, so this is W at the top, this is G, okay? The cross-section, the flux I have is equal to the magnetic field times the cross-sectional area. So that cross-sectional area, sorry, that's incorrect, it's not, it's, uh, it's the uh, la, 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 la. the flux that I have across some length L, okay. That flux there is equal to G L, okay. And the magnetic field is equal to, I develop for a certain current I is equal to mu R mu naught I over W, okay. So using that idea. I can obtain that the inductance over that length L okay, is equal to 1 over L phi over I. Okay. Imagine that L is some unit length. And hey presto, the lengths cancel out and it's equal to G over W. Okay. Right. Similarly, the capacitance over some length is equal to epsilon r epsilon naught times w l not omega w l over g. Okay. And if you think about the voltage and you think about the length and the gap, you can show that that's true. And that gives it the characteristic capacitance is equal to epsilon r epsilon naught w over g. It's the other way up. Okay. So all I've done there is to go from here to here. So it's just divided by the length. Okay. Have a look at drawing out those fields. See if you can work out, look back at how you work out the flux and show that that equation is correct. Okay. But the important thing here is we work out the velocity, which is 1 over root L tilde C tilde. Okay, it's just the same as it was before. Okay. We've ex we can explicitly work it out one more time, but this is time for a different geometry. It's still the same. Okay, so even though we flattened out our cable and got rid of one of the conductors, we still have the same velocity. And again, we can write it down to the velocity of light <coughs> over mu r epsilon r. And again, if mu r is equal to, to 1, then that's equal to c over n, isn't it? Okay. And this is generally true. In any transmission line, the velocity of the wave along the transmission line is only dependent upon the properties of the dielectric which is between the conductors. Okay? It's independent of geometry. Independent of geometry. Okay. Right. So let's write that down together just to summarize. So in our microstrip, the impedance, so we've written down the velocities, they're all the same, they're not interesting. Let's work out the impedances. G over W explicitly, and then hey presto, we get mu R mu naught over epsilon R epsilon naught. Okay, we had the same factor we had before. In our coaxial cable, the geometry does affect the impedance. So the geometry does not affect the velocity, but it does affect the impedance. So on the left, we must have something which is due with the geometry. Okay. 
So these things on the left are the geometry factors. And on the right, we have the same thing we had above, which is something to do with the material. Okay. Now notice that if the material is free space, then Z here, then this would be Z zero, wouldn't it? space. So if you had a coaxial cable which was air filled or a strip line that's somehow air filled then that, that material coefficient would be through the 77 ohms. Okay. Now let's look and get a bit more closely about what those, um, what those electric magnetic fields look like. Okay. You kind of brushed over that. So let's do that for the strip line. As we'll see, this is now we're going to be related to what's happening in the waveguide later on. So at some given instant in time, okay, and at some given position in, along that strip, I'm ignoring the fact that the ground plane extends elsewhere. The only bit that really matters, because this gap is small, is that the, the, the corresponding bit on the ground plane to do with the strip above. At some instant it has some voltage V, and at that instant there are clearly electric field lines pointing down, and because there's a current flowing, there will also be a magnetic field pointing at right angles. Okay. Assuming the current is pointing into the page, it'll be that way, won't it? The current on the top is pointing inwards, and the current at the bottom is pointing outwards, and the magnetic field points is uniform and points transversely. We work that out explicitly. The electric field is given by the voltage as minus V over G x hat. Okay, it's in the, uh, it's in the x direction, which I just didn't point out, was pointing upwards. And the magnetic field, okay, and again show that you can do this, mu r, mu naught, whatever the current is flowing in the top, it's balanced by the one flowing at the bottom, divided by the width in the y direction. So explicitly calculated for the microstrip, it's also true for the coaxial cable. But this is a simpler geometry. But you can show, and you can show pictorially with the, micro, with the coaxial cable, this is also true. So clearly the waves are travelling down each of these transmission lines, down the cable or down the microstrip. So that's K, that's into the page, or into Z in this case. And the electric magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other, obviously. So this particular case here, you can see, it's what we call a TEM case, right? which means transverse electric magnetic. Okay? Transverse electric and magnetic. Okay? So that means the, the, the electric and magnetic fields are both transverse to the direction of propagation. That's true here. It's not always true. The ratio, if you look closely here, the ratio of the peak electric and magnetic fields is equal to the velocity, is equal to C. We saw in free space it would just be C, but it's modified by the material properties. This is the properties of the dielectric that sits between those two conductors. Okay. What do we do with that? Well, let's, re let's remember that. The pointing vector is defined as being whatever mu is, one, in this case it might be modified, mu or mu naught, okay. E cross B, and this describes the power transfer, doesn't it, across any surface. So this is the number of watts being carried across a surface as a function of time, because E and B are both varying, both varying in phase, so the power transfer is at any surface, right, at any position along here. Sometimes it's high, and sometimes it's low. So at some instance, there's no power transfer at all. Okay. So the power at any particular plane is equal to, obviously proportional to the maximum current and voltage, but it varies with time. 
and it varies with position. Okay? So you can see that clearly it varies with time, as you'd expect. Right? But what's also true is that any particular position z, as time varies, p is occasionally zero. Right? So if we were to draw that out, this is a sum plane, this is time, and this is the power crossing any, that surface. Occasionally there's no power crossing it which is a little counterintuitive. And if we work out what the average power transfer is over all times, to see the half angle V naught, we can rewrite that in terms of V naught and the impedance. Okay. This is the half I naught squared. So again, this is the characteristic impedance. So things that this sort of relates that idea we had about that impedance of free space. If we had a strip line in free space, then the power transfer along the strip line would be proportional to that characteristic impedance, which is 377 ohms. Okay. That's when mu r is equal to 1. Right? Okay, that's what's happening down the transmission line. What's happening at the end? So now we're going to link. So you can see we've, we've been carrying on. We've, we've been looking at a few apparently disparate ideas, but they're now starting to connect together in these last few lectures. I hope you'll find it satisfying. Right? Let's look at our transmission line, which has some characteristic impedance Z. And we had a source at the beginning, we're going to forget about that. Now we imagine some load at the end, okay? And I'm not drawing it as a resistor, because it could be any kind of load. It might could have a capacitance, right? It could be another transmission line. Okay. Could be a resistor. Could be another transmission line. Okay? And of course, the other transmission line could have different impedance properties. Right? Could be ZL equals R for just a simple resistive load. Now you can see here that previously we wrote down across some boundary between two media, right? We had some boundary and we have we wrote down some reflection coefficients to do with the fact. That they were, we could write down in terms of an impedance on one side and impedance on the other. Well, of course, we've got exactly the same thing here. And you see this in circuit theory, I think. Okay. In general, at some boundary, there will be some reflection. So this looks much the same as it did for two dielectric media. Transmission line boundaries and dielectric boundaries are much the same. So we can write down all the same equations. So here we can write down a reflection coefficient for the voltage, which is defined as being the reflected voltage over the incident voltage. Okay, so you can imagine the, they, they will have to uh, they will have to sum up. And in this case, if we imagine there's some load, and then we've got the impedance of the transmission line, it looks like this. And this is just the same. These are just the same as the optical cases, which is very cool. We can write it down for the current again, and the current, which is ir over ii, okay, we have the same switching in the numerator that we had in our dielectric case. When we're considering the electric and magnetic fields, these two coefficients swapped, and they swap here for the voltage and the current, okay, because they're basically due to related phenomena, aren't they? So obviously there are special cases in the transmission line. Obviously, if the load impedance equals Z, then it's as if there is no, there's no boundary. Okay? The impedances are the same, so rho V equals rho I equals zero. There's full transmission. Okay? This is called a matched line, and that's obviously what you want. Matched lines are better. Okay? There's no reflection. So in all practical cases of transmission lines, you want to avoid reflections, or you want to manage them in some way. The other, two pit, the other two situations, 
Well, firstly, what you can do is you can just take the two wires at the end, right? These two wires here, and just connect them together. In that case, there's no load at all. The impedance is zero. And obviously that means that the reflected voltage is equal to minus one, and all the current that goes up comes back. Okay? So that's a shorted line, obviously. So I've just connected the two wires together. And if I don't have any load at all, and just leave the two wires hanging in empty space, at the first order, the impedance is infinite. And now, of course, the reflected voltage is equal to one. Whatever goes up, the pipe has to come back up, has to come back again. Okay. And now, whatever current goes up also has to come back. Okay. That's open circuit. And obviously there, the I must cancel whatever goes up. That's like our antenna picture, wasn't it? Okay. The I has to cancel. So you can see here, all the way along, and we'll see this in the next lecture when we look at waveguides, that there is an equivalence here, an equivalence here between the voltage and current picture. That's what we've done all the way through today, right? We've looked at voltages and currents in a transmission line, and we've looked at it in terms of a circuit theory description where we are... Um, working out that there must be a wave equation along a sufficiently long line and we worked out what the velocity was in terms of the voltage and current picture. Okay? We then looked through at a strip line and realised that if we had a varying voltage and a varying current we would generate an electric and magnetic field. This is what we'll see better in our waveguide thing in the next lecture. You can see there must be a equivalence here between the electric and magnetic fields and the voltages and the currents. So here's our equivalence. And you can see straight away that when we consider whether we have transmission or reflection, okay, we have transmission or reflection, our picture of the transmission line is very similar to our description of a dielectric and the boundaries between two dielectrics. It's the same basic idea. Okay. So that's it for transmission lines. Please read ahead and look in the notes about waveguides. Our basic idea about waveguides which is different here, is that in a transmission line, we have two conducting things, and in the waveguide, there is one. And that's the important difference. Okay. And we'll show that, that by having, having a boundaries on the side, we'll get different electric and magnetic behavior. We have to see how to handle that. And that's what we'll do on Monday.
I turn it down a bit because when you have it 